kom ons sluit ons oor, kom ons bid saam, Lord, you are everlasting. You are from everlasting to everlasting. We acknowledge you in our presence as the Most High. Lord, we pray that you'll open our eyes that we may see your word. That we may see your finger and your hand pointing to each one of us showing us what we need to see. We pray, Lord, that you will lift up your banner above us. The banner of victory and of strength. And that you work in our hearts courage in this battle. so that you may rule not only as Messiah on the donkey but as Messiah on the white horse we bow to you Lord and we pray that you will work in our hearts that we may embrace all of humility that we need. Lord, we, that we will not stand before you in arrogance, but accept your word in gratitude. Cause our whole being to be your system that you will pour your loving water in. Lord, may your name be glorified. May your name rule. May we embrace your name in your word. In Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to talk about a sub subject or subjects, whatever and however way we want to mention it. This is my own abbreviations, okay? Put myself through you. Wisdom, understanding, knowledge, prudence. This is a mouthful. We're talking about the whole word of God. Wisdom, understanding, knowledge, and prudence. We can write it in a different way. That we, the way that we find it in the Bible. Hebrew is a four square alphabet. The Lord's name, yud hey vor hey is a four-square word, four-square name. 
You will find the truth of God always in a four square, square way. You usually find four great topics or divisions when you study the Word of God. So you find your yud, hey, vo, hey. These are very nice pens. Thank you. Yud, hey, vo, hey. I don't know where to start because the subject is so big, the little, the little bit that I know. It's like jumping into the sea and trying to swim to the nearest land and you don't see it. You don't know where it is. Right. We'll get to the scripture, but God says he wants to work his kingdom in us. When we talk about kingdom, we talk about the king. We're talking about the king's name is a four square king. Four square name. God wants to square us out. Through sin, we've become rolling stones. In eternity past, the Bible teaches us that we were made, we were squared out of the great quarry, which is the Zor Rock, the Father. As I said, this is scripture. And through sin, we've been squared out. I remember when I was at school, people and children would say, that guy's a real square. It means he's different. You can't influence him. He's not part of the crowd. God has got his hand on each one of you, and he wants to square you out. Squaring out... A stone needs a lot of chiseling to be done. My family tells us that part of my family comes from the Scottish. And they were in Natal. And they were masons. I don't know what a sandclip in English is. But... What is sandclip in English? Sandstone. And what is told in the family is that they were masons and there are specific quarries there where they uh, chiseled out big stones. Some of the buildings in Peter Maritzburg, they transported those stones into Peter Maritzburg by ox wagon. But those stones needed to be chiseled out, not square, all right, in that sense, but like big bricks. And many of the old historic buildings in Peter Maritzburg is built by stones they have squared out, they've, they've masoned or chiseled out there in a tell in those banks of sand rock. You and I, we come from the great rock, the old rock, the Zer rock, the father. And we've been chiseled out of there. And what the word, the, the way the word teaches us is that through sin we've been, the squareness has been taken out. And God takes us through circumstances where he wants to square us out once again with his name. Every letter of the word consists of his name. Every letter, every thought that God has over you and me is to square you out. To make you peculiar so that we can fit in to the eternal building which will glorify God. Paul says that we are living stones, 
living bricks. And he is the cornerstone. All right. On further. So, this is called the field. Many of the parables that Jesus, is, that Jesus teaches about his kingdom, he says it's like a field. Right. So where you are in your and my circumstances, where we are, you are in the field that he has beaconed out for you, where he has organized masons, Circumstances, people, agents, things to chisel you out and chisel me out and to form his name in us so that we can eventually be taken back by the wagon. His wagon. Ezekiel saw his wagon, his ark. His presence taken to the specific place where you need to fit in to the eternal building. It's a way of just putting it where you fit into the kingdom. Because there's a specific place for you and me where we are to go back to. Right. In these different corners, Corners, another way of explaining corners is circumstances. Each one of us are in a specific circumstance. Whether you and I define it as good or bad, we're going to look further on, because we need this to discern between good and bad, but whether you define it as good or bad, because there's good and bad within that circumstance, God wants to work his name. Now, now, there's different circumstances. Each one of us, is, if I would ask you what circumstance, Teresa, are you in? You would say a specific circumstance. You would ask me, is it my finances that you're talking about? All right, my circumstances of my finances is this. If, if I ask her, uh, are you in uh, any other field at the moment, you would say, yes, are you talking now about my relationships? In my relationships, I am in this circumstance. Or maybe she says, do you want to know about my circumstance at work? So I would say, yes, tell me something about your circumstance at your work. Then she would explain to me her circumstance at work. So we talk about different aspects in your life, different fields where God has got masons, where his hand holds the chisel, where they are busy, and where he is busy working on you and me. So when we talk about corners, we talk about specific circumstances. Now the Bible defines those circumstances in different ways. One of the ways that God explains it to us is he calls it the poor, Stranger, fatherless, fatherless, and widow, corners. We've said many times to, to one another, my wife and I, that I, we think that we are in all four corners at the same time. In one circumstance, maybe in, in relationships. You don't know which corner. And the idea is not for you to find out and find out in which specific corner you are in. Because you will have aspects of every, every one of those uh, situations, maybe. Right, but it's a way of explaining. God said to the prophet Jeremiah, he says, go to the, the potter's field. And let me show you something. 
Jeremiah. So when you get to the potter's field, because we are talking about the field, we talk about the potter. We can either talk about the clay and the potter, or we can talk about the, the uh, masons and, and the, the sandstone or the stone. Whatever way, doesn't matter. But there he showed Jeremiah that that lump of clay is put on a wheel, on a potter's wheel. And if you would ask any, what do you call somebody that works with clay? A potter. All right. If you would ask any potter, which way does the wheel turn when he wants to make something from the lump of clay? He would tell you anti-clockwise. Why does it turn anti-clockwise? So that the potter can work something useful from that, uh, from that lump of clay. With pressure from the potter onto the clay, he puts pressure to it, and then he turns the wheel, usually it's with a, with a, a pedal uh, by the, of the foot, uh, a mechanism that as he... As he presses with his foot, the wheel turns, and as the wheel turns, he puts pressure to the lump of clay, and that way he takes out the impurities, and that way he starts forming the vessel. Do you, are you experiencing some pressure on you? Full it of your liver, of your varald, or in your ronde dry? Sometimes you just feel your life is turning like a wheel, you don't know whether what is up and down and what is left or right or center or, or whatever. You try and make out what is going on. Don't worry, you are on the potter's wheel. He knows what he's doing. Another way of putting it, if you would talk to the, to the, to the, to the rock, do you know what the mason is trying to do? He would say, no, but what, I, what he's doing, I don't like what he's doing. He's chiseling on me and I hope he's got a, a plan or a, a, a form in mind that he's, that he's working on. Don't worry. He's, he knows what to do. Our problem is we rebel. Our problem is that we react and resist and we moan and we groan and we do everything to resist what the potter or the mason is trying to do. And the Lord explained to Jeremiah, he said, sometimes that lump of clay gets so distorted that he needs to take it off the wheel, put some more tears to it, your tears, put some tears to it, make the clay more workable, soft, put it back onto the wheel and turn it again. And how many times have you been taken off the wheel? Uh, moisten your own clay with, his, with your tears. Tears of rebellion, tears of anger. Yes, tears. Tears of sorrow, tears of repentance. He uses all of that. The word says he takes every, every drop of tear in, a, in Psalm. He says he takes every drop of tear and puts it in a bottle. And he keeps it. For when he needs to need to make that clay moist. So that you can I can be you and I can be workable. Right. Now let me take this black is more visible. Right. If you read the Bible. If you read Proverbs, you will get this exact order. You will get this order. Wisdom, understanding, 
knowledge, prudence. Many times those principles are hidden within the portion of scripture that you read. Many times those words are hidden because of translation. But let me tell you this, and this is important to understand and to remember. When we talk about wisdom, understanding, and knowledge, we're talking about principles that are interconnected. All right, for that sake, inter, uh, there's, uh, they have an interrelationship. Interrelation. Interdependence. Inseparable. In da. What is is? Acceptable. Inter acceptable. In inseparable. Inseparable. The one affects the other. The one contains the other. Do you get the idea? Therefore, sometimes with the translations, uh, the translators, sometimes they've used the word understanding where they should have used the word wisdom if they were so precise, but then maybe the whole, the whole uh, sentence wouldn't have sounded, you know, uh, correct English uh, in English and therefore they've used the word understanding so sometimes these words are interchangeably it's another word that we should write here interchangeably inter change interchangeable so this so this begrippe Dit is eindelijk waarhede wat in mekaar en van mekaar afhankelijk is, mekaar complementeer, mekaar ondersteun, mekaar beinvloed en mekaar veroorzaak. Misschien een goede manier, goede woord om te sê. This is important to understand, to remember this when we study this subject. What is important to say maybe here, when we talked about circumstances, this wheel has got its axle, always. Your circumstance and your different circumstances runs on an axle called Aleph. All of this always related to the middle, it's a wheel. Ezekiel saw wheels within wheels, turning. Like an old watch, those old watch, watches that we, I remember my grandfather had a, don't know whether it was a Zobo, I had a Zobo watch, a pocket watch. My first years at school, take it out, because I saw my Grandfather doing it when we when we were on the bus, the buses those days, the old old toppies, the old guys, they had chains with their watches there. When I was in the train going to Natal, all the old conductors would have the long golden or silver chain with their watch in, and every now and then they would take it out and open the little flap and look at it. So I did that as well. You would see. The watch, everything has got an axle, a driving shaft. Your life is not out of control. Your circumstances is not out of control. 
It is under God's control. Maybe out of your control. And maybe because uh, everything is not... Uh, what's the word when you calibra uh, calibrate everything according to the middle and everything starts turning exactly? Yes, revolving, but I re let me put it this way. I remember when, when we had bicycles and you would go and dry, ride over this pavement. You would wobble your, your wheel. And then you would take that wheel to the, bi uh, to the uh, uh, cyclist. 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 And he would put it on a machine and he would, he would send, uh, uh, enline it. That's maybe the right word. Align. Align the wheel uh, in respect to the center. Your wheel alignment and mine is out. So if you feel your life is going like this, it is, it is so. But he's trying to enline your wheels and my wheels. His name, because it's about his name, his kingdom, he's trying to prepare us for eternity. And we moan while we are on this chariot that we are riding in with four wheels, none of them are central, uh, centralized or in line. It's a rough ride. Right, and while he does this, he works with his wisdom, his understanding, his knowledge, and his prudence within us. And just to have a short commercial in between. A short commercial, Claudio. When we get to this corner, here is what we talk about, the bridal corner. The bridal corner. Most probably you can't see that. Just like all these different colors. Bridal. Just to start off with, the word wisdom is a female word. The word bena is a female word. If we talking in any sense about being in the bride, you and I will have to go through corners and through this whole, this whole operation that God is taking us through to give everybody a proper chance. Now let me do it on that more there. The word for wisdom can be spelt in different ways for the sake of my brother here with the Hebrew. Uh, I'm, I'm going to spell it in English, uh, in Hebrew now, but in, uh, in uh, uh, English it is sometimes spelled this way. Or this way. Kokmo. I found different ways in the, the way that they spelled that, but let me give you... Uh, uh, this spelling right that will help you a little bit better however you pronounce that I don't know but anyway the ancient Hebrew therefore is spelled with a chet A calf, a mem, of course, and then a hay. I'm going to write the biblical Hebrew down here, chet. A calf. The mem and the hay. The reason why I'm writing that is that gives us a lot of clues of what the word wisdom means. So we don't need to put our own translation into our, our own definitions 
uh, some church politics, all of that is cut out. We're just looking at Scripture. Because that will prepare us for eternity, nothing else. All right. Uh, how would you pronounce it? Help me. Hekma. Hekma. Right. Wisdom. Uh, understanding, we've studied a little bit. I don't want to give you a clue then that we're going to come back. But we've studied understanding, which was in Hebrew, we said bina. Didn't you say your surname was close to that? That was another one, okay. Bina. Uh, bina, of course, is spelled with a bet. A yut. Uh, a noon, of course. And a hay. We are doing groundwork now. We're laying down the foundation for a few weeks of study. Okay? That's why we're taking time to make sure that our foundation is sure. That's why I'm taking time in writing this. And giving you both uh, what's the miss? Alphabet. Alphabets. Same alphabet, but anyway, different ways of writing it. All right. So the bet we find here, the yud, the nun, and the hay. Pana, wisdom, understanding, knowledge. Knowledge is the art. <clears throat> the art. That's a D. All right. The art. Just make sure here. Is it Dalet? Ayen? And uh, tough. Dalet, ayen, and tough. Well, we won't deal with prudence now. But the bride's name eventually will, will be Prudence. That will help you to remember. Will be Prudence. Uh, I would just like to bring this in because it seems to pop up everywhere all the time, what I'm going to write down now. And that is uh, da'at, this knowledge. Usually, not usually, it, it refers all the time to the word I'm just writing it here. Uh, yada. All right, let me just write here for you to pronounce. Yoda. Uh, da, sorry. Yoda. Uh, let me uh, spell it to you. Yoda, of course, will be a yut. I'm just checking myself. I'm not good with spelling always. Yoda. With a Dalet and a, a Yut, a, a, a Hay. So it's a Yut, Dalet, and then Hay.
Now what does Jada mean? I'll first give you the, the assimilated meaning. All right. Yoda means a knowledge that you have got personal experience with. That you have got intimacy with. That you've got experience with. It means that you have got experience with. The understanding. You've got experience with wisdom. I'm, I'm free translating now. All right. And then if we look at the if we look at the spelling of it, we can say a lot about it. I, I don't want to go too much into it now, I'm just saying. So this knowledge doesn't talk about the Greek understanding of knowledge most of the times in church, in the church world. Understand, uh, knowledge to the church world and the way the church world brings it, it is kenis, in information, which is just in your mind. You can do with it what you want to. So they, they don't discern like in Hebrew, they specifically dis discern this and uh, with da'at knowledge is actually knowledge that the Father has. The Father has got all knowledge. And He wants to give some of that knowledge to us as we go through circumstances. But that, circ that knowledge is experimental knowledge, empirical knowledge, knowledge that you experience, knowledge that you use. Knowledge that you allow yourself to be guided by. Gu knowledge that you've picked up through experience. I know in many, in many instances, in the workforce, many companies, I suppose construction companies, employ, that is what I've been told, employ an engineer that went through the practical leg of education rather than through university and having the theory just the theory because the engineer that went through the practical learned from start how to implement certain knowledge how to implement how to implement and grow thereby and in eventually uh, qualify as a qualified engineer while well, you get another engineer that goes to the university and he goes through there and he, go, he does a lot of theory, a little bit of practical, and at the end of his course, then only he really enters the practice. And for many companies, this guy that, has got, that picked up the, 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 the experience as he, his knowledge grew is more valuable to that company. Now we talk about a company here that is eternal, a kingdom, where he, wants, where he builds his kingdom as we go on. The Greek mentality is that you know everything and I know everything about the kingdom and I can quote scriptures to you and I can, uh, you can ask me where certain things may stand in the scripture and I can take you there quickly. Why? That's nothing. That means nothing. In the kingdom of God, and what the word kingdom means, is what you know is uh, your practice. It is part of your character. It's part of your reaction. It's part of your uh, intu uh, intuition. It's part of your uh, impulsiveness. Your, your and my impulsive reaction is... Uh, proof of the kingdom that has been worked in us. So that's what we're talking about. That's the knowledge that we are talking about. Right. So when we talk about hokmah, wisdom, 
We talk about the beginning. It is the beginning. It is the very start of everything in the kingdom. It is the beginning. Hokwa uh, 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 wisdom is the beginning of understanding, the beginning of knowledge, the beginning of prudence. Right. It is a female, as we said. Let me just put it there so that we can have everything together for refer reference. It is, as you can see, it is a female down. What do we say with that? What does God say uh, through that? He says to us, it is a bridal character. It is a part of uh, a character that comes through a, a love relationship. It comes through a relationship. So when we talk about wisdom, we're not talking about sitting with, you, with a glass of red wine on a cushion in the corner of your room and philosophizing as we did. When I was a student, before the Lord really started taking this rolling stone and started chiseling me, we thought it was wise, wise to sit with a glass of red wine, and talk, and talk. I remember one of our things when the guys would come and speak to us about their relationships, their girlfriends. There was one poster, I always said, <laughs> the poster said, if she was yours, help me, help me. Yeah. You must set her free. And if she was really yours, she will come back to you. That was one of our wise sayings that we got to at the end of the night when so tears and sobs, of the guy was sobbing about this girl that he's lost now and that she's gone. And we would say, after all, if she was yours, she would return to you. You are the fathers. You and I belong to him. His name is written on you. Part of your genetics. The genetics of your very breath proves that you are from Him. He wants you to return and me to return to Him. He takes it very serious. That's why He takes us through all of these activities, situations, circumstances, to return us. But we cannot go back to him in an offlenter. He wants to put on you a new robe. He wants to put a ring on your finger. He wants to put shoes on your feet. He wants to put something on your head. We've learned about the crown. He wants you and me to be properly dressed. Because every portion of your dress is an indication, is a result, is a fruit of your growth and your relationship. Is that difficult to understand? Because it seems to me that the church world don't understand that. That we can wobble, 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 talk about things and impress everybody and talk about nice things. But meanwhile, meanwhile, back at the ranch, things are completely confused. Because nothing seems to work out. The doctrines, so-called doctrines, the so-called Torah, doesn't seem to work out. We're talking about truth that will stand examination. Right. So when we talk about wisdom, we, we are saying to one another, the reason why you are in the circumstance that you are in is one of the many reasons which all come together here in describing it this way, is that God is working His wisdom in your life. This word, kokmah, or hokmah, wisdom, means skill in war. That's what the concordance says. 
skill, not kill, skill, skill in specifically in war. And you will agree with me that you are and I am in a war, a war with self, a war with your own desires, a war with your own uh, sentiments, a war with your own tradition, a war with the world around you, an economy, and we can carry on with politics. There's a lot of things, a lot of enemies in our lives. And for that, you need skill, which comes through wisdom, which is wisdom. David says at one stage, he says, Lord, teach my hands, my fingers to fight, to use the sword. But in Christianity these days, it seems, because it's preached that way, that you just quote verses, and that is what does the job. In the olden days, you wouldn't just give somebody a sword, and then he can use it. Claudio, if I give you a big sword, and I hear from people that were in these museums, in Romania and Scotland, Graham was in there, one of those uh, Scottish, uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, apparently those swords are as long as the men were. And they were heavy. It wasn't a little pocket knife thing and you, you, you use it. You needed to exercise, to have skill, And you needed a lot of strength. So that's why the Lord talks about many types of strength. We're going to touch it, Lord willing, today. If, if you've got your Ammonite here, we can continue for a few days. There are many words that the Lord used for strength. He uses the word uh, koak, he uses the word chabura, and so on. Strength that we need. Which you don't get mahala. You pay with your life for that strength. You never get something for nothing. You don't get something for nothing. So, with your or my life, we lay it down and God gives you strength. Strength for what? To show your muscles? No. Strength. So for one of the reasons is so you can use your, your shield, so that you can use your sword, so that you can be a light on the foot, like a heart, like a, a hert, um, like a hind. The problem is. We are all in a zo war zone, in a battlefield. In this battlefield, it's not those that can talk. Talk. When I was on the border, and you get the new guys when they come up there, they talk. They've seen these American movies on, you know, where you take the hand grenade and you pull it out with your, with your teeth, and you throw it. That's the first thing that your instructor will say to you. This is not Hollywood. You do not pull out. A hand grenade pin with your teeth. You will lose your teeth if you try and pull it out with your teeth. So, the doesn't, it's the same oorlog praikies, soos wat daar gebeur in die christen wereld. Het is nie hulle wat oorleef nie. Het is die wat, they've got the t-shirt on. You and I need the t-shirt in this war. It's they that will come out victorious. So we're talking about wearing the t-shirt. Another meaning of this word, okmo, it means uh, prudence in religious matters. Prudence. In the religious matters. Now do you see, I've said to you, 
These words are used and these principles affect one another, contain one another. Here we're talking about prudence and we're talking about kokmor, okmor. Well, prudence is actually here on the diagram. It is, I've, put, I've placed it there. So you can see how when God, and when you practice wisdom, how it affects eventually the, the, your bridal character. So wisdom is the beginning uh, principle of life. Remember, never forget it. I might not con remind you continuously about it, but remember, wisdom talks about wisdom is God. Understanding is God. Knowledge is God. And prudence is God. So we're not talking about faculties outside of God and outside of the relationship that you have with Him. So don't become religious. We must guard against being religious now and think about a principle and forget about the principle, the headmaster, the one. Who is wisdom, who is understanding, who is knowledge, and who is prudence. And the only way that I get to all of that, should I say it now? I see it's not in my notes, so I should have said it later on, but I'm saying it now. The only way to get to all of this It remains the same principle from beginning to end. The KISS principle. Now what is the KISS principle? How did your relationship with your wife start? All right. Just, just talking. Then you held hands. Then you kissed. Then, you realize you need a covenant. And then, the intimacy grew. But the kissing was the entrance to all of that. I don't know how relationships work today. I'm talking about biblical principles. All right. That's how it works. The same, your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Yehovah Yeshua Moshiach. Your my relationship with Him. At the weddings that we have conducted, I would always bring this in because I knew, I know, the older men would sit at the end of their seats when I mentioned that. I say to them, and I say, usually at the weddings, what does research say? How do you bring romance back into the marriage relationship if you've lost it or if you need it to grow and to be present? I said, and I say, through research, by research they've discovered that Husband and wife, if they would kiss 12 minutes a day, it will help to revive romance in the relationship. All right, by then, those that were sleeping, they're all awake, looking at their wife, did they miss something? What did I say? So they heard something about the romance back, so their eyes start flickering. In Christianity, it's exactly the same. Everybody's eyes become dull and they become asleep because a relationship has become just a partnership with him they give him orders and he needs to jump 
they think they need, he needs to jump and he needs to do and he needs to listen. And he's not listening. Like I've heard many married women say, if my husband would just listen, our relationship would change. I say no. If your husband would just listen to God's voice, that will bring the change. Okay. What was the point I was getting to? Christian, yes, thank you, the kiss thing. So Christian, you and me, today, we're not talking about when you are asleep now. Do you know what you need? You and I need to kiss him. We need to pray what the Song of Solomon starts off with. I think it's the second verse in Song of Solomon. The bride-to-be says, Kiss me with the kisses of your mouth. That I may run after thee. Now what does kiss mean? Kiss is this word. The word kiss is the word noshak. That's just the English of that word. Let me try and uh, see where did I... Noshak. No shock. Which then? Biblical Hebrew. Nun. Shen. And then um, Kof. Nun. Shen. And Kof. Like you go from, well, cough. That's right. Kiss. Kiss. Another word of saying kiss is touch. Affectionate touch. You know what a touch can do in a relationship? An affectionate touch. We've learned at university, many experiments was done, especially in the middle, in the middle ages. One emperor or one ruler of a community hired uh, mothers or care caretakers over a few babies. And the same amount of babies they had in the other side of the castle. This side of the castle, the, every baby had its own caretaker and uh, mother. And the mother touched them, uh, caressed them, fed them with their, with, their, you know, with their hands, touching them all the time, touching their bodies. And those babies were uh, growing. They were alive and well. The other section of the castle, we, this was a true experiment that was done. The same amount of babies, same quality, if you can say quality of babies, were this side, and they had uh, one or two caretakers over all of them. They were never touched. They were given all they need. They were given their bottles of food, and their nappies were changed and so on. Their diapers were changed and so on. But they were never really touched and caressed. They all died. And the experiment was to, was to prove that we need affectionate touch. Even in our marriage relationship, affectionate touch. Now when is a touch affectionate? It's when you mean it and when you put your heart into it. And that is how God wants us to touch Him. 
He wants us to put meaning into it and uh, feeling into it. When we go on our knees or when we sit down and pray, when we lift up our hands, when we lift up our hearts, it's not just something that's on our lips, words on our lips and in our mouth, but it comes from deep within us. We mean what we say. That's a touch. And you know how much information is carried over through a touch, an affectionate touch. If you study about marriage counseling, you will learn. And you will see how much information goes over in a touch. When Jesus was in the crowd, and the crowd was pressing on him, and, somebody, and they were rubbing shoulders with him, but when somebody touched him with affection and meaning, he stopped. And he said, somebody touched me. And the disciples said, ah, somebody touched you. I mean, everybody's touching you here. There's a few tens of people rubbing shoulders literally with you. Now you're saying somebody touched you. Yes, somebody touched me with meaning and intention. And she was healed. So we talk about a touch with meaning and intention when you pray and when you read the Bible. Say, Lord, touch me. I need you. Kiss me. You touch me. I touch you. That's where the relationship comes from. So I say to you that all of this wisdom, understanding, knowledge, you get twins. Uh, Words that are twins and triplets. I don't know. Quadrets. What's the fifth? Or oh, five. Fifthlets. <laughs> but words that belong to one another that are close relatives. Now the close relative. I can't get these things apart. The close relative of wisdom, understanding, knowledge, and prudence, the close relative that we find all the time in between is this word, kiss. Affectionate task, touch. Noshak. Uh, no Nash. Okay. I'll try and remember, but if I say no shock, forgive me. Okay, because I've been used to say it that way. No shock. But this is the right spelling. I, I think I must just focus here a little bit to explain the kiss. Because if we, if we miss that, we are busy with religion. And that kills. Karl Marx said one truth. He said religion is the opium of the nation. Everybody smoke the religious pipe, the charismatic pipe. And they all get blurry eyed and addicted to this pipe. And when I decided, and the Lord pinned me down on my back, on the floor, like in wrestling, I said to him, I don't want this whole story of leaving Jesus. I'm fed up with this. Either you teach me and you show me, Jehovah, Yeshua, Moshiach, the emperor, the great I am. So we are talking about him. We're not talking about religion. That's why I'm going to take time. That we never forget. While we're going to teach and learn all, not all, something about this. Something, something. Not even so much. We must never forget that it's about the kiss. And you and I need to touch him and he needs to touch us. Constantly, consistently, don't tell me that you've been saved 20 years ago. I want to know today. Where do you stand today? Have you been touched by him 
today. Are you touching him today? And tomorrow I'll ask you the same question because it's relevant. <coughs> Otherwise it becomes knowledge and it destroys your life. Yes, we will be able to talk it and that's all. And people will become nauseous around you because they will hear this talk and it will make them what's the word it will, that's the word I'm looking for it will be repulsive that's why Jesus said to the religious people he didn't say to them you haven't got the right principles you do not you cannot analyze the word you cannot tell me about the structure of the word the wonderful absolute uh, technicality of the word uh, he, he couldn't say to them you do not know about the numerics and the theomatics and all of that he said to them you know what you are vipers you are snakes because you talk the religion but you must one that is alive and king of all you've missed him so let me say that emphatically so how do we get with a kiss if we look the first letters talks about the seed of righteousness this noon to explain it this noon consists of a zayen this noon This noon, this noon consists of a zayen. A zayen is the zayen year, year. Talks about emet, the truth. Not what you and I define as truth. I've explained and spelled the word truth to, to you and me. So, what is noon? When will I become faithful to the truth? What does noon mean? It means, and what do you see here? You see, it has been worked in her and me. Knees bent. A position of humility. Humility has been worked in her through the truth. If truth do not have its goal, which is humility in your all my life, it will kill us. Knowledge will destroy us. Truth will kill us. What we are learning here can either kill you or make you alive. What I'm teaching with you here is very dangerous. It can destroy us. If you and I do not bend in humility and see the word and the truth, and you and I lift it up so that people, when they see you and they hear you, they will not see you and hear you. They will see the truth and they will hear the truth coming from you and from me. Then we are talking about noon. Then we are talking about faithfulness. So it's not faithful in quoting the word of God. The reason why the word the Lord gives us the word here, he, he takes us through all of that to tell us here, do you see why? You need to bend your knees. What is humility? Humility is to see me in the light of him and to see him. Not to see me as one of the mothers of the disciples say, sitting on his right hand and you sitting on the left hand and we've got equal, right? Or like Peter said on the Mount of Transfiguration, Lord, let, we, let us build uh, 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 a little shack, a little shelter for you and for Moses and for Elijah, all on the same level. Since we are here, I mean, we are equal. God's kingdom is not a democracy. Democracy doesn't come from God. What's he, monarchy? What is it? Autocracy. What's the other word? Why in ruler cry? Monarchy. God's kingdom is a monarchy. 
a king. It's not. You vote, I vote, he votes, and then everybody votes, and all right, then truth is established that way. That is a church and religious mentality. Truth doesn't depend on democracy. All right. So what we are teaching here is truth, which can either kill you and me, or give us absolute everlasting life. I didn't say eternal life. I said everlasting life. Yes, eternal life. But I'm talking about the ultimate everlasting life. So, when we're talking about the truth that we receive today, it needs to make and work in us the character that truth does, which is humility. And what is so wonderful, we find it here demonstrated in the alphabet for us. First of all, his knees, her knees. If we can talk about you and me as her being the bride, your and us and her, her needs starts bending under the truth. And then later on, as we see continuance and growth, we see here with the Tzadi, here the, 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 the Zayen, the knees are even bent more. The rabbis say, why is it bent more? He says, because humility is the way that you continue. If you want to grow and continue, you need for the next step more humility than you had just now. And then for the next step, more humility than you had. And then the next one, more humility. Because you realize more and more that it's the truth that is carrying you. It is the truth that is keeping you. It is the truth that is blessing you. And it's the truth that will take you all the way. Not your knowledge of the truth. Truth being part of you. Actually, let me put it that way. You becoming part of the truth. You're being absorbed and assimilated in the truth. Here we see. Here we see exactly what I'm saying. And absorbing, as being assimilated in this relationship. How does he? How does he? I get so angry in the church world when people talk about holiness and being separated. We've heard that for many, many years. Oh, we are separated from the Lord. Really? 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 To be separated, it takes us through circumstances. We are truly separated. We get chewed and assimilated by God. Or when he spews you out, <coughs> because you refuse to be assimilated, broken, separated, pain. How come you have this pain? Some of them are not. Because the Lord is a or because the Lord is someone who you want to martel. Nee, so that you klein genoeg kan worden dat hij ook kan assimileren. Je deel kan worden van hem. So the Lord takes you through pain so that you can, you can, you and I are not so big anymore. We can be assimilated. That's what the kiss is about. Because the problem is Christians coming here learn about the kiss principle and they just talk about the kiss principle. It's not talking about the kiss principle. It's living it. And that will separate us. My kisses that I give my wife and that she gives me separates us from other relationships. If you walk around and touch other people with affection, other uh, opposite sex, sex people, other, you understand when I say opposite sex, when you touch everybody around you, research says becoming naked emotionally to others 
opposite sexes. That's when you start having problem in your, in your, in your relationship here. Because you are walking around, touching, reaching out affectionately to other lovers. Kissing that, kissing this principle, kissing that like. I, I hear that the people say that you must go on their website and then you put their like. Like. Some Christians' websites, when we go on the website, there are so many likes. In the sense of, in the sense of, kissing this, which is not really, 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 what God wants. Kissing that and kissing that and kissing this and kissing this, and eventually they become confused. Don't walk around and kiss everything that you see and that you like. You don't need to write on that website like. I don't like the whole idea. So I never put down like. But here, what are you doing here? So, no shock, kiss. Is the most important secret, concealed, hidden principle in all of this. Don't worry, I haven't got much notes. I only got your um, six pages, but we're not busy. We're only busy in half of the first page. Right. Let's just turn. Reading, just, just to, for a warm-up. Let's just turn to... Uh, Colossians chapter 2, verse 3. I'm going to give you a few verses quickly. Okay, so the idea is not to see how long you can take to get to the scripture. Try and get to it quickly. Colossians chapter 2, verse 3. Dit is net warm makers, om net vir ons te wees, ons aandag te vestig op hoeveel keer kom hier die woorde, wijsheid, begrip of understanding, kennis uh, in prudence. Hoeveel keer kom dit wel voor uh, that is, uh, we're, not, we're not touching the, 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 uh, the iceberg at all. We are just tipping on the iceberg of uh, words in the Bible that where you find it, the scripture where you find this. Colossians 2 verse 3. Just going to make here and there small remarks. In whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In who? In Him. In Christ. In Jesus. In Him is hid or concealed all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Which words are used here? The words Hokmo and Da'at. This principle of Da'at we will deal with because Da'at has got many other uh, relatives to this basic word that we will deal with. So we see here, it is in Christ. In Christ. As we said, in the kiss principle, in the relationship, where wisdom is hidden. We need wisdom, and as we seek Him in that relationship, we will, re we will learn skills in the war that you are in. And skill and, and prudence in the, in the religious matters. Right? Colossians 3.16 Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Let the Torah, the principles of God, dwell in you richly. 
in all wisdom hokmo teaching apparently the church today doesn't believe in teaching apparently they don't give much teaching take one word or one verse or portion of a verse and they talk and embroider around that till they completely off the rails okay here we see teaching <coughs> let it dwell richly the principles the torah of god the principles of the kingdom let it dwell in you richly in all wisdom teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs singing with grace in your love or hearts to the lord right so wisdom shall increase and wisdom is a, a principle or a part of the relationship that grows in us as we grow in our relationship with him our skill in this war grows now a sword handler which is really skillful will really have an effect in war so many times we have met people through the years christians jarlik het dis net een groot ge donder en bliksems en wolk en rook en stof in blare in klippe in hare in naals so sal a godsdienstigheid toepas aan die einde daarvan het niks verander nie how many times have we met in the christian world people it is just lightning and, st and striking of lightning and thunders and dust and sand and rock and everything flying around when they pray and in the end of that nothing has happened and unfortunately people have seen that and say this is a mockery this is, this is not real christianity doesn't work they are fools which is true if you're busy with the truth nothing changes in the sense of the principles remain the same and then change does take place but according to God's according to what God has said will happen right Ephesians 1 verse 8 Ephesians 1 verse 8 wherein he hath abounded towards us in all wisdom and prudence as i said you'll find these words always as pairs or where the whole this whole principle is mentioned here we see in wisdom and prudence these words that has been used here in all wisdom and prudence Okay, let's turn to the next verse. James chapter 1. Let's, uh, don't uh, go there. James chapter 1 says, if you need wisdom, ask for it. Talking about hokmo, wisdom. How do you get it? Ask for it. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. One Corinthians chapter two. We're going to look at the first seven verses. Uh, 
And I, brethren, when I come to you, came not with ex excellency of speech or of wisdom. Not talking here about godly wisdom. Okay. Declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know that anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. If that was our mentality in our home, in our marriage, in life, wow. Wow. That would have been wonderful. That we do not want to have relationship, intimacy, allowing other things to touch us except Jesus in our lives, in our circumstances. But fortunately and unfortunately, things do touch us. Because it's things where we have not been squared out. That's where we get touched. And that's when we need to humble ourselves, lift our hands, and speak our trust, which is called faith, in His, in his ability to change you and me and to take us through. Okay, so here we see, it says, I determined not to know that, eh, that, Anything among you, save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. Paul not being full of himself, but in absolute humility. As we said here, in noon, because here he comes as a faithful witness. And he comes here with a characteristic that noon has and that Tzadi has because he is a Tzadi. He has learned to come in humility when it comes to the word, to come in humility, and my speech and my teaching, my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. Oh! Immediately the church world says, here we are, we've got something here that we can, that we can market power. Paul said he came in power, so Paul did all of this and he did all of that. No, what power are we talking about here? That word power that is used here is the word koak. I didn't write the Hebrew down here, but in English we spell it K-O-A-K-H. Koak. All right. All right. Which means the beginning of powers. Koak, if we can explain it this way, is like the embryo from which all the power comes from. All right, if I can explain it that way. Like in Philippians 4.13. Let's turn there. Keep your place here at Corinthians. Let's just go to Philippians 4. Philippians 4, Philippians 4 verse 13. Scripture that you are familiar with. The whole church world, the whole religious world knows verse 13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Right, so I can do all things, anything. I can do this, I can do that, I can all do all of that, 10 of these, 20 of those, and so on. Because you see, the church world defines the all things. Let the author define the all things, okay? Let the author define what he means by all things. Then we will understand where... Oh, what power is he talking about? Because that word, when he says there in verse 13, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. That word strengthen is koak. Or the word that I've used. When he says there, uh, when Paul says, I came with demonstration of the spirit and of power. And Christians capitalize on that. And we say, all right, all right, all right, all right. Let's calm down. Let's see what it says. It's talking about co power. So what does co power talk about? One of the places where the author explains himself, like here, for instance, in Philippians chapter 2, or sorry, uh, Philippians chapter 4, uh, 4 verse 13, he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But let's just see just before that what Paul is talking about. He says there, for, uh, if we can just start at verse 11, now that I speak in respect of want, he says, I've got a need. I've got a financial need. I've got an emotional need. I've got a psychological need. I've got a need. Not that I speak in respect of want. He says, I'm not talking about that, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. I 
I know both how to be abased and know how to abound everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full, to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. He says, so what? You can your back or blast from it. It's not etni or from it. It's court, from it. It's well air or what you call. You cannot blow up your lips, blow up your mouth and have a bad attitude and be irritable and be angry because uh, things are not going the way that you want it because God has got you on this wheel of him and you're going through many circumstances, maybe all at once, you feel poor, stranger, fatherless, and widow, he says, it is God, do you know what? God will give you strength to be content where you are. That's where God gives strength. So Paul says, I've come to you, I've been content, content, I've demonstrated to you what God's power can do in a man's world, a man's life. My life is under his control. I really see him as the sovereign one. And through all of, all of that, because people said, how can Paul be content? Paul has, has gone through all this pain. He's been, he's been shipwrecked, he's been... Uh, uh, martyred, he's been, he has gone through so many circumstances, and here he comes and he brings to me the word that he says it will bring you joy and peace, which means prosperity, but the kingdom definition of prosperity, which is peace, which means fulfillment, which means satisfaction in your circumstances. Here he says, you know what? And how do we get that strength? That co-op. It can be explained this way. One of the ways to explain it is this way. When we moved into this plot many years ago, 26 years ago, we had for many years, maybe 20, 25 years, cattle. I milked a few cows every day with my hands. There was no, no houses here, no fences. With the horses, we took the cattle out in the morning. At evening, we brought them back. We made butter and many things. My wife is very industrious. So, that's the only butter we knew. So, what, does, what do you do? You take the cream off the milk. So if you've been given, uh, what is, when you dig, when you give somebody skim milk, the Bible never talks about skim milk. But anyway, if you give somebody skim milk, you can do nothing with skim milk. You can barely give your, give, keep yourself alive with skim milk. Because you need the butter inside of it, you need the energy in it, the minerals are in the butter, and the fat, and, and many things are in the fat. And I, I know cholesterol. I know all of that. All right. So you do, you take the cream, you put it in a bottle, you let it uh, sour a little bit, and then you shake it. You are actually, you're making, you're actually starting to demonstrate coax power, how it works. You start shaking it, and you shake it, and you shake it. I would walk through the house and I would sing like, like an old medicine man. <laughs> and after some time, it separated. Suddenly, you've got this chunk of butter with the buttermilk. Threw off, we drank that. And then we put salt to the butter. Okay. We're not going so far in my explanation of what is koak. Koak is when you take the word of God. We talked about kiss. So here we're explaining kiss and koak. You will not have koak without kiss. You bite off a chunk of truth. I'm giving you the recipe. You take up 
you pick up a chunk of truth. You start shaking it inside of yourself, thinking about it, assimilating it, digesting it. Think it how it applies in your life. Uh, start taking your thoughts and uh, reorganizing, re reshuffling your thoughts. Start realizing what the word says and what this word implies in your life. Start shaking it, shaking it, shaking it. And God will even help you to shake you. He will put you on a vibrator there at the gym. You've got a vibrator. If you hold on to that, that thing really shakes you. And sometimes God just takes you and he puts you onto that. Boom. And he puts on the vibrator and you shake like mad. Circumstances, people, things that happen, emotions, a lot of things shake you. If you've got word inside of you, which is not skimmed milk, which is full cream milk, which I am giving you here, full cream milk, then, first of all, the cream gets separated, then the creams get shaken inside of you, and then suddenly it solidifies. That is how co work is formed. Right. Not quoting verses, memorizing verses, which is the beginning. I'm not making that. Uh, uh, um, putting it down. Yes, but it shouldn't stop there. And you shouldn't apply it where, the, where it suits you. It should be applied in the context of the Word, within the framework of the Word of God. It should be placed. Right. Then he says here, uh, Sorry, we're back to Corinthians chapter 7, huh? 2, yeah, 2. two. Uh, he says here, And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, power, koak, and that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of man, but in the koak power. Of God. Right? How be it? We speak wisdom. He says, yeah, we speak. Go up. Ach, uh, uh, Among them that are perfect. Right. Who of you are you perfect? I can see that you are interpreting according to your understanding of the word perfect. All right. Perfect. That word perfect means at the edge. It means those that have been riding on the potter's wheel. And come to the edge, the last corner of his name. So that word perfect means those in whom bridal qualities, uh, those who has allowed God to work bridal qualities within them. So therefore, if I ask you this, you should put up your hand. Because yes, definitely, all of us has gone through many experiences up till now, in different aspects in your life, I've explained it as I've explained in the beginning. Yes, we've gone through many things. Yes, not all of them, but in some of them we did. We did allow the potter to keep us on his wheel. Or yes, we did allow the circumstance to chisel and to square and to square me out. Yes, we did allow him to touch you affectionately, and you've touched him within the midst of that as you've gained consciousness, <laughs> and as you've gained sobriety at times, because many times these things intoxicate you and they uh, influence your thinking in such a way that when you get a elder woman, uh, um, a bright, uh, a bright moment. moment that you reach out and you touch. You touch him. And with that touch, 
when he touches you, it, with one touch, he, he injects wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. And prudence. God doesn't need time. We need time. When God does something in your life, you can do it like this. Right, maybe we should just... Maybe I didn't say that. This da'at. There's a family of words going along with da'at. Let me just... I said it does come from your da'at. What did I want to say now? Yeah. It means to have intimacy with a person, with an idea or concept. Right, I think we should just do it up to there. Did I tire you too much? You're tired, exhausted. The Lord has blessed me so now I can go on for another four hours. If you, if the Lord churns the stuff in you, and when I speak, it churns more. And you know what this butter? Butter is energy. It's concentrated fat. When the Lord there in Isaiah, is it Isaiah 7, where he says, Isaiah, yeah. He says here in Isaiah 7, verse 15, Butter and honey shall he eat, that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. That's another study that we can do. Let's start with that study. He says here, How will Yeshua Moshiach, how and where will he get his strength from? Uh, just before that, in verse, seven, uh, verse 14, he talks about Emmanuel. He says, Butter and honey shall he eat. When Peter says to the Christians, desire sincere milk of the word. That word milk is not skim milk. Full cream milk. All right. Because we need that type of fat, that type of energy, which comes from the fatness of the word of God. Olive oil, oil that comes from the rock, is fat. It's greasy. Gives you calories that we need in this Christian walk, this race, this war, this battle that we are in. So, what have we reminded one another? That you are in a war. I am in a war. We need skill to handle the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. We need skill to shoot an arrow straight. We, we, need, we need skill when the enemy comes and challenges you to give him a death blow. Not play around. We need skill when the arrows, a fiery arrows is shot onto you to lift up your shield effectively. Not to lift up the shield and say, oh, the shield is about this big. We're talking about the shield. That will cover you and me. And we can continue with this all. Let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, your word makes us feel big. When you turn, this truth inside of me. I can experience your strength and your power, your excitement, your fire, your joy. 
then we remember sit down humble yourself kiss the feet of the truth that has been given it is his truth and his truth alone will bring an everlasting effect but an, an effect in our temporary citizenship and the journey that you, are, that you are on, that we are in now. We pray, Lord, as your word and as your Torah teaches, the Torah or the principles of your kingdom has got one goal, and that is not the teaching, but the living of it. And with that, Lord, we want to put our hands in our own bosom and say, Lord, so help me, God. Help us. If word say, he is the naprediker van if word. Help us to listen to your voice when your wo voice speaks to us after you've given your truth to us. Your word says that your truth is the spirit of truth and will lead us into all truth so that we can be safe amongst so much confusion we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.